All right, so let's now, rather than dump, jump into code that was prefabbed as last time, let me rip this apart in a manner that's a little more clear. I feel like.、Uh, Last week did not quite do some of these ideas justice and were a bit confusing, so let me now fix. So it feels like something like this this printing of something in a loop that's taking as input some number, like n, can kind of be factored out. So that conceptually I could have, as we did last week, a chorus function whose purpose in life is to just sing this song. This, again, is an example of the fancier term hierarchical decomposition, where you simply take some chunk of code that conceptually does something, and that's it. It's very well defined what it does. Factor it out into a function just to kind of clean up what's going on in, in your main function. And so by that I mean this. Let me go ahead and copy this code temporarily. Let me go down here now and define a new function. It's going to return void because it's just going to print. It's not going to return any values or numbers. I'm going to call it like last week chorus. Just to be clear, I'm going to go ahead and call this int bottles. I'm not going to call it n this time. All right. And then I'm going to go ahead and paste in that same code. And I just need to tweak it a little bit. I need to change this to bottles, and everything else looks pretty good. So let me now scroll back up. I definitely don't need this anymore, but what do I want to put here instead? How do I call a function that I've written? Yeah, it's just the word, just like printf,、uh, chorus, and then I need to pass in the value n. So why do this? Well, now if you kind of scroll back up, and this is one of the Uh, aims of good design. It's actually now really super simple to read this program as for the first time and realize, oh, I can totally wrap my mind around this quickly. First, it's prompting for some input, it's getting that input, it's doing a sanity check on the,、uh, what value the user types in, and then it's printing a chorus. And what's nice now is you reach the end of this function main, the program is done, and so now if you are curious, and once you've wrapped your mind around this program, now you can dive in deeper and say, okay, what is chorus? And sure enough, if you scroll down, now you can focus on this more bite sized program. So, this notion of decomposition is partly for this reason here, so that frankly, your programs don't become this and this and this long, where by the time you get to the halfway down or the bottom of the function, you forget what you even did before. Rather, much like an English story or an outline for an essay, you can get a sense from Maine alone what's going on, and only if you care as to how a chorus works do you need to look down lower in the file. Now, we can do this slightly differently, but there's a bug first. This code will not compile. Why? Yeah. Yeah, so I need this thing called a function prototype because, again, C is pretty primitive in that if you don't tell it that something like a function exists, it's going to assume it doesn't if it encounters it earlier in the file. So even though chorus absolutely exists down here, I need to provide a little clue at the very top of my file, and I don't strictly need to hit enter here. It's typically more common just to put a line like that. I just need to copy and paste. Literally, the function's prototype. It's return type, so the word like void, but more on those to come.、Uh, the name of the function, chorus, its type of integer,、uh, type of argument, and in this case, its name. Though, as an aside, its name is not strictly necessary. You might see in textbooks that people just do this. That's fine too, but it's somewhat simpler and more readable, I would say, to include the name of the argument. So now this should compile. Let's take a look. Let me zoom in. Let me go ahead and make beer one. It did indeed compile. Let me go ahead and run beer one. We'll do, let's just say, 99 bottles of beer.、It、zooms by, zero bottles of beer on the wall. But there's still a bug. Not so much a logical bug now, but really a grammatical one, which is what, obviously? Yeah, so now I'm kind of mispronouncing this. One bottles of beer on the wall feels like we can do better, right? And this might seem like a trivial little thing, but all of us kind of, you know, if you notice these things in Windows or Mac programs, You kind of, you know, eyebrows go up if you see something stupid like this in a program that you paid for、um, or <laughs> downloaded and it's just got grammatical mistakes in it. But this is actually really easy to fix, right? Conceptually, we just need to do what inside of this loop? We just need to conditionally say bottle or bottle. So we can do this in any number of ways. In fact, the simplest might be to do this. So if i equals equals one. Let me go ahead and indent this. Let me go ahead and do a little copy paste, but that should be your first warning sign. If you find that you're doing a lot of copy paste, odds are you can do something a little differently. So let me do this here. So if that, else, I'm going to do this. Let me scroll down. Let me print this over here. 
So now I just need to change the grammar. So if one bottle of beer, one bottle of beer, technically this is a little redundant now. Do I need to be doing the placeholder? No, you can leave it. But so in short, there's a number of ways we can do this, right? I could hard code the number one at this point, get rid of I, and then also do the same in the second line. Or I can keep it the same. But it feels like we're doing a little too much work here, right? We're kind of copying and pasting two pretty ugly lines of code, making them almost identical except for the omission of one letter. So, what could we do instead? So, use the conditional. OK, so we saw one clever approach with like a one liner whereby we just factored out,、um, whereby we factored out this condition. Let's actually not go there just yet. Let's see if we can't simplify at least what we're asking for. What if instead I do this, where if i equals equals one, really the whole sentence doesn't have to change. Rather, it's simply what aspect of it? It's, it's the word. So, what if I said something like、uh, s gets bottle? Otherwise, S gets bottles. And now I don't need these curly braces because it's just one line of code. This isn't quite right yet, but notice where I could go with this. So let me actually rip out this because I've decided、mm, I don't really like this approach.、So、let me move this over here, get rid of this. So now we're back to the original version except for this part up top here. So this isn't going to compile yet, and it's not even useful yet because what do I need to change here? That could be percent %s. That could be percent %s. Then I'm going to have to plug in s here. Then I'm going to have to plug in s here. But what else am I still going to have to do?、Sure. Yeah, so I still need to declare s. So let me do this string s, but OK, a y wait a minute. I kind of need to do it here then, right? Because only one of those branches is going to execute. But still, broken. Why? Yeah, scope. So again, this issue of scope. And even though in this case we have just single lines of code, and so we're allowed to cut a corner, we don't strictly need these curly braces. Remember that rule of thumb that if there are curly braces, or effectively there are, except in this special case where you can omit them, really that means S will exist here or S will exist here. But as soon as you get Here, later in the program, s is gone. That memory is no longer accessible to you, so you can't say the word s. So I need a better solution. So I can't declare the variable inside the curly braces or inside the condition, but I can declare it, for instance, here. So on occasion, you will encounter scenarios where you have to declare variables a little sooner than you actually want to use them, but you need to declare them somewhere within the scope of the chunk of code that you want to use them in. Now, recall last week we had what we called, it's called the ternary operator. It was that funky thing with parentheses and so forth. It turns out that if this kind of strikes you as kind of ugly, and my God, I just doubled the size of this function just to do something stupid like print out bottle or bottles, well, realize that there are syn-、uh, there's syntactic sugar in languages like C where you could actually say this string s gets. Either the value bottle or bottles based on whether i equals equals one. And if i does equal one, I want it to get the word bottle. Otherwise, I want it to get the word bottles. And so what's nice is all this kind of ugly code, not wrong, wouldn't be penalized for this, certainly, because it is correct and it's nicely indented and so forth. But you can actually simplify this to something much more elegant. And so this is the so called ternary operator as opposed to binary or unary in the sense that it actually takes three. Uh, values, one to the right, one to the middle, and then one to the left. But that's just、uh, unnecessary jargon. So, would this work? Is S now in scope? So, it actually is. So, this is nice, a nice one liner for fixing the grammar. We haven't fixed everything, right? This is still broken, and I can't quite use the same word there necessarily. But let me wave my hand at that final detail. But the idea, hopefully, as to how we can fix the grammar is hopefully more clear now. Yeah. If else, el-、uh, if, and if else, if, else, if. So you could absolutely do that、um, to contrive a scenario here. If i equals equals zero, I could say、uh, s gets no bottles and yell, for instance. Else, if i equals equals one, then I can do s gets one bottle, for instance. Else, I can do s gets uh, uh, bottles. So, in other words, I can have as many branches as I like, and as before, I don't need those curly braces. Oh, oh, I'm sorry, I misinterpreted your question.、Um, no. <laughs> so, that was the shorter answer. No, you can have, well, actually, that's, that, okay, no, I'm wrong. So, 
you can. It just starts to get less clear. You can actually put another set of parentheses here, and another question mark and colon, and then another set of parentheses and so forth. But I would、uh, argue against doing that because honestly, it becomes much less readable if you're not sure which one lines up with which idea. So I would use it just to this degree. Yeah? Really good question. So, if you declare a function in this way with a prototype at the very top of your function, that seems to run the risk of colliding with other functions you wrote and might still be using. That might run the risk of colliding with functions other people wrote, right? For instance, what if the person who wrote the standard IO library, whose header file is called standard IO.h, what if that file contains a function called chorus? Well, in C, you're kind of out of luck. Like that happens. There's no notion of what's called namespaces or packages in C. So, this is a problem that is solved by more modern languages, which we'll get to later in this semester, among them PHP, JavaScript, and the like.、Um, C handles this, as does Java. But in C, you cannot, for instance, steal the name of a function that someone else wrote that you are using. By way of including it with something like this. So, you could not implement get int. You could not implement、uh, printf unless you were willing to sacrifice that other person's version of it. Good question. Yeah?、Uh, Ah, good question. Would you want to declare the string s outside of the for loop?、Um, you could, in theory, declare it outside of the loop, and you would then still have access to it because it would still be in scope. But the problem is that the words are changing as this loop iterates. It might go from 3 to 2 to 1 to 0. It might go from 2 to 1 to 0. So, in other words, you need to make the decision. At some point, conditionally in the loop, as to what word you're going to spit out. It, you can't do it based on n alone, right? Because it's not n's bottles, it's the i equals 1. Oh, I see. Absolutely. So if you wanted, you could do this here. However, I would argue as a matter of style, this gains you nothing. Oh, and I see what you're saying in terms of efficiency. So, this, is,、um, this would be recommended against these days. The version of C that we are using allows you to do exactly what I did the first time, and the compiler, namely GCC, is smart enough to realize that it doesn't need to reallocate a new 32 bits, 32 bits, 32 bits, or whatever it is for that particular string. All it will do is update the assignment. So, for that kind of detail,、um, generally the compiler is smarter than us, so you don't have to. Worry about that. Good question. Yeah?、Um, well, I mean, if you had the same, if you had two libraries with the same function name in them, you could not use them together. It would break. The compiler would yell that, previously, it would yell that the function is previously declared. Good question. All right. so...